Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Chinari. This is Great Big History Podcast. And today we do Qing Manchu China from 1644 to 1912, the last of the 5,000 years of dynasties to run China. This is the last. And it is a foreign dynasty. So we go back to the Mongols. So basically, the Ming failed in trying to keep out foreigners from running China. They eventually gave up to the Manchus, people of the north, barbarians from the north, who would be the last great dynasty. So when we left off with the Ming, the Ming were falling apart. You have lazy emperors, corrupt officials. You have a silver crisis, which is creating an economic crisis. You have famines in northern China, which is creating rebellions. And you have the Ming stagnated to keep out change. The Manchu tribes are related to the Jin, Yurkin, northern barbarian tribes who had dominated China, nor- northern China at, during the Song and had been crushed by the Mongols. These guys are on the move. North of the Great Wall, they're, they're fighting and they're becoming unified. Then they invade in the 1630s Korea, pulling that ally away from the Ming. Then they allied with the Han peasants who were rebelling against the Ming because of the famines. And the, they open up the Great Wall and let the Manchus in. They were perfectly willing, the Manchus were perfectly willing to incorporate defeated peoples. They had Mongol parts of their army and Chinese parts of their army. Interestingly, the Chinese part were the heavy guns, the muskets, representing the new technology and the new power, the future. The Manchus were still horse bow and arrow people, like the Mongols. But like the Mongols, the Manchus were willing to incorporate defeated people if they were willing to work for the Manchus. In 1644, victory. They capture Beijing, murder the Han peasants, who then said, hey, we're the Han, we should be in charge. And the Manchus like, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. And then they began the conquest of southern China, which was itself breaking up into two things, peasant rebellions and Ming loyalists. You know, provincial Confucian, Ming, Han loyalists who are like, oh my God, China is being invaded again by the foreign peoples of the north. We have to defend against it. They will all be run over. Um, The Ming will escape to the west and especially to Taiwan, to Formosa. um, A thing we will see again in the 1640s. So what do we get? We get Confucianism. We always get Confucianism. Why? Well, one is the Manchus are barbarian peoples. And so they respect the settled peoples of China. They know China is smarter than they are richer than they are, more advanced than they are. And so there is a respect for traditional Chinese culture and hierarchy. But remember, Confucianism is about loyalty to the emperor, loyalty, uh, you know, all the way up. All of these constant um, overlapping Venn diagram groups of responsibilities. So Confucianism works really well for... Um, kings and emperors. Two, we have the Han defeat. Again, the Han do not run China. And Chinese men begin to have to wear their shaved heads and the Manchu braid as a sign of submission. This will become the 19th century American image of the Chinese. And it will be take on racial overtones of subservience. So this becomes a long braid, which is not Han, not Han at all. The barbarians of the north did not cut their hair. Farmers do. You can't have the hair in your face when you're farming and all that. So this is a sign of subservience. So the Han Chinese men are defeated. Conquest. This is big China. This is biggest China. Or close to biggest China. It, ha- it will dominate China proper. The Yellow and the Yangtze Rivers. 
bit to the north, a bit to the south, but it will also dominate Tibet, Central Asian nomads, Mongolia, inner and outer Mongolia. It will go all the way west to Afghanistan. It will also dominate North Korea, or I shouldn't say, it will dominate Northern Korea. This is the largest, most ethnically diverse China. And it will have some 400 million people in it, as much as all of Europe. It will even defeat Russia out in Central Asia. So the, this is a, a empire on the move where the Ming were dying and collapsing. This is an invigorated, mobile, expansionary China. This is big China. It's going to absorb a lot of people. And it's going to make demands on even more people. The positives. You get the Chen Chenglong Emperor from 1711 to 1799. A long period of stability. Huge investments in literature. Oh, Chenglong is Q-I-A-N-L-O-N-G. Q-I-A-N-L-O-N-G. Chenglong. 1711 to 1799. Huge investments in art literature. In fact, creates an, ex an archival encyclopedia of knowledge that goes out to thousands of books. It was, it was supposed to handle all the knowledge of the world. There was the Four Treasuries Project. Massive archival, archive in of knowledge, of philosophy, of religion, of literature. There's so much money that he cancels taxes which he's seen as Confucian. I don't need the money. I'm going to give it back to you. You could use the money better. Lots of internal trade, strong external trade, especially in spices, silk, tea, and luxury items like porcelain. Again, because the Ming have been collapsing, the Manchu, the Qing, need money. And so they, are, they go back to export. There's stability. There's few. Once they conquered the, the outer peoples from 1644 to 1700, once they conquered the farther peoples and absorbed them into a China. Now, they're not making them necessarily Chinese right now, but they're absorbing in these people. There are few wars, no invasions, and peaceful borders. But they've absorbed almost all of Central and Eastern Asia into their borders, so it makes sense that they would have peaceful borders. Uh, by the way, their border is now well hundreds, if not a thousand miles to the north of the Great Wall. Inner Mongolia, outer Mongolia, Manchuria, well to the north of the Great Wall. So you have this massive 2,000 or so mile wall that is just sitting there in the now. It's the middle of China. It's now the middle of northern China or the more, middle of northern Qing Empire. So it's a curiosity. It's like, whoa, why is this thing here? That was the border of Ming China. And now it's well into the interior of what the new border is. There are problems. And after Chenglong, there's decadence. It's so easy to be decadent in China. You're not being invaded. You've, ta you've got plenty of money. You've got loyalty. There's not much for you to do. So there's no wars. There's lots of money. There's always the problem of Japanese pirates, which we'll, of course, get to. But other than invading Japan and taking over Japan, there's, at this point, not much to be done. So they become decadent again. It's hot tub diplomacy. You could go out to Afghanistan 3,000 miles away, 4,000 miles away, and fight to conquer the Middle East like Tamerlane wanted to do in reverse. Or you could stay home in Beijing in a hot tub and enjoy yourself. And guess which one most emperors pick? Exactly. Two, there's no navy. The Manchus are not navy people. So they're unable to control the seas. They're horse people. They're from the north. They don't hang out on the ocean. And so 
This is one of those places where their understanding of the world hurts them because they don't convert to being Navy people, to ocean going people. Having conquered the land, they don't worry about the sea. And so pirates will attack trade and then the Europeans will show up. Their solution, move inland. Remember, the Manchus don't care about the Yellow and the Yangtze River Valley. They're not Chinese. They're Manchurians. Manchuria is way to the north and practically landlocked. So they're land people. It's like Switzerland or Austria suddenly building a giant navy. It's just not, it's not where their concern was. Agriculture continues to be the number one industry. So you had agriculture plus 400 million people. You have to feed these people. Remember, there's not yet industrialized agriculture. And so you get conservative economics. There's no need for technology. Just add more people. There's no slavery in China, but there's not not slavery in China either. You can always get people cheap. So labor is cheap in China. Whereas it's expensive in Europe. And so there's no need to invent machines to do the work. You just add more people. The best and the brightest will own land. If you made money, if you were successful, you didn't start a business. You didn't invest in corporations. There was no stock market. You bought land. You started plantations, tea plantations, spice plantations, still some export driven stuff, but you bought land and you lived as a landlord. Confucianism, always a positive, but also sometimes a negative. And here it will be increasingly, it's a conservative philosophy, which is its whole purpose was to make peace. Confucius created Confucianism not to be progressive. Not, well, he was progressive, actually, because he was trying to end war, but he was trying to put China back together, which is ultimately very conservative. He doesn't want a lot of change. That's the whole hierarchy. That's the whole responsibilities. So there's no innovation at the local level because of Confucianism. It's hard to break in for new or mobile families. Remember the, the test, the Ming exams. Locked out poor people. Not literally, but for all intents and purposes because you, you couldn't get the tutors to teach you. You couldn't go to the prep schools to help you learn the stuff to pass the tests. So there's few innovations at the imperial level. See, you could have no innovations at the local level. Everyone's farming, they're making money, they're doing things, and they're fine. If you got innovations like Jungle at the, or Jungla, excuse me, at the imperial level, running things, making changes, being progressive, but there aren't because they're decadent. So if the emperor was good, the Manchus are good, things are stable. Why change? You don't need to do much. This sounds great, and it is great, as long as European steam navies and Japanese industrialization don't show up. And guess what? In the 1800s, they do. The Europeans will show up in the 1500s and start blowing stuff up. They showed up to the late Ming, but they're going to show up with steam navies in the 1800s and sweep everything. All the local Coast Guard, the local Navy, that eventually the Ming, the Qing will create, the Manchus will create a defense force against the Japanese and in come British steam navies, gunships that just sweep everything in their path. From the 1820s to 1912, Western, then imperial, then, excuse me, Western, then Japanese imperialism is going to hammer away at the Qing, causing collapse and civil war. We're going to talk about Western imperialism in part two of our class, so more to come there. We're going to talk about Jap Japan in uh, one of the next episodes, 
So more to go there. Japanese imperialism will be in part two, like the Meiji Revolution. And Japanese industrialization will come in part two as well. So we're going to get to the, the, the nuts and bolts of chain collapse. But from the 1820s to 1912, the Qin are collapsing. They're technologically behind. They're socially too conservative to change. The Manchus are increasingly seen, and this is where the Civil War comes in, as the foreigner who is ruining China. Remember, China's the greatest place on earth to Chinese. And so you're messing things up. And increasingly, the emperor is going to be tied into European domination. The emperor is going to make money off the Europeans. And it becomes pretty clear to um, Chinese revolutionaries that to get rid of the Westerners who are ruining China, you're going to have to get rid of the emperor. And if we're going to get rid of the Manchu emperor and the, Qing, and the Ming emperor, the Chinese emperor was terrible. Maybe we don't need an emperor anymore. The Europeans don't have any. The Europeans have kings, but they also have parliaments. So maybe we don't need an emperor anymore. And that collapse is coming. Thank you.